All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. We have sang our songs to our Lord and Savior. We've worshiped him um, completely and thoroughly. I believe that. And now we're going to worship him by opening the scriptures. Please open your Bibles with me um, to the book of Mark, Mark's gospel, chapter 16. This is the last chapter in the book of Mark. And as you're turning there, let me introduce myself. My name is Douglas Humphrey. I have the privilege of serving here as the lead pastor. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us on today. If you're a first-time guest, thank you so much for being here with us on today, whether you're online or in person. We know that by um, the advent of technology and live streaming, you could be any other place in the world watching other services, but you are here, and we trust the Holy Spirit has brought you here, so thank you for doing that. And then to all of our regular attenders, God bless each and every one of you. To our members, thank you for your continued partnership in the Lord as we serve the Lord here in Southeast Raleigh through BFC. And those of you who are working for Jesus, practicing our fourth W, you're working for G Jesus. Thank you so much for your sacrifice and using your skills, your time, your talent to serve the Lord through this place. Without you, we would not be able to have our midweek services or even our Sunday services. And so thank you for agreeing with the Holy Spirit and letting him use, exercise your gifts through this ministry. Today, um, uh, we are in Mark 16. And so if you're not there, please start turning there even now. Um, this is going to be the last sermon um, in the book of Mark. We've been walking through Mark from last year up until where we are on today. And so I don't know about you, but it has been a labor of love for me. Not just because I wrote the sermons, but the fact of all the issues that Jesus deals with in the book of Mark. First, we're introduced to Jesus as the only begotten Son of God, the Lord and Savior of all humanity. And we see Jesus work tirelessly to preach the gospel. And usually the prerequisite to the gospel going forth is him performing miracles to draw people to himself so that he can share the gospel with him. And despite all the good work that he did for his Lord's glory and his Lord's honor, no matter where he turned, there was always people who were against him. The biggest group being the Pharisees and later the Sanhedrin. And we saw how Jesus had to refute their false teaching, their attacks, uh, uh, and everything that way. And he continued to remain steadfast towards the cross. And then Jesus gets to that last and final week of his life the Passion Week. And he enters into Jerusalem and they're hailing him all, Hail King Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna. A few days later, Jesus is taken captive because he's betrayed by one of his disciples, and then he's forced to stand a, a fake trial. He's found guilty, condemned to die. He's placed on a cross, and he dies. And that's where we left Jesus on last week. All of that happened up to where we are right now. And I don't know about you, but it's caused me to rethink my faith in Jesus Christ. To know that one man, being the God man, loved me so much to go through all of that. He knew how the story was going to end. He knew he was going to be born. He's going to be placed on the cross to die for our sins. And he openly stepped into his role, his will that God the Father had for him. I don't know about you, but it's definitely changed my view of Jesus Christ and how I relate to him. And I pray that some of that, some of that Holy Spirit work is taking place inside of you, that you would take your faith more seriously, that you would see Jesus more clearly in the scriptures, and that you would live your faith out loud in the culture in which we find ourselves where you guys are going to be the minority. We are not the majority in culture. You guys know that. And so today we're looking at the resurrection. We don't want to leave a, our Savior dead, do we? And so we're looking at the resurrection. So the resurrection is our main focus. This is the, the rejoining of Jesus' body with his spirit when Jesus was raised bodily from the grave. And this is significant because, because of Jesus' resurrection, it ensures our justification. In other words, the work that Jesus did on the cross was sufficient for God to change our legal status from guilty sinner to innocent begotten son or daughter. Otherwise, if that work was insufficient, if it wasn't enough, then Jesus would still be dead, forced to keep paying our sins over and over and over again. And that's one of the reasons why people who die outside of Jesus Christ, without putting their faith in Jesus Christ, when they die and they go to hell, they're there to suffer eternally, trying to repay their sin debt. Jesus paid our debt perfectly. And so God raised him from the grave. And so we are going to figure out what this resurrection thing is all about. The resurrection is an undeniable reality with eternal significance. I want you to hold on to that as we walk through the scriptures. The, the resurrection is an undeniable reality. You cannot refute this. It actually happened. And because it actually happened, because Jesus did this, it has eternal significance on our lives. And so... I have four goals for us on today as we work to talk about this topic of resurrection. Number one, I want you to gain a biblical understanding of what actually happened on that first Sunday morning after Jesus died and three days later. Number two, I want you to have your faith amplified in the resurrection. And we're going to do that by examining and refuting false theories about the resurrection. 
Then number three, I want you to have an emboldened confidence in Jesus by providing you with compelling and abundant um, evidence that Jesus was, in fact, raised from the grave. And then last but not least, number four, I would love for our hearts to be overwhelmed with gratitude and joy for what Jesus did, being raised from the grave. You see, we tend to think because things happened so long ago, they're not as important to us. But Jesus' resurrection is just as significant today as it was when it first took place. Amen? And so, as you can see, we have a lot to cover. And I don't ever want to give you guys information, 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 and you get overloaded with information. But to help you further take in this information and further digest what we're looking at in the scriptures, I have a five-day devotional that you can use to help you with this. It comes out on Mondays at midday. There's also a QR code, yeah, and a bulletin for, your, for the weekly devotional. So on Mondays, those go out. If you want to get signed up for that, then please sign up. There's a devotional for every sermon that I preach going forward. And so as we now get ready to look at this topic, let's pray. And then um, we're going to dive right in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Holy Spirit, would you prepare our hearts and our minds to be transformed by the undeniable fact that Jesus has been resurrected from the grave. Lord, keep our flesh from getting in the way of receiving your word. Help us to make much of you, Jesus, during our time together. Holy Spirit, have your way. We are completely dependent on you. And Lord, as your preacher, would you grant me courage and boldness of speech so you might be glorified and these your people will leave here edified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, Amen. Amen. and thank the Lord. So on that first Sunday morning, Jesus is resurrected from the grave. That's the first thing we're going to look at. On that first Sunday morning, Jesus is resurrected from the grave. And if you don't have sermon notes uh, or a Bible, put your hand up. We'll get those to you. But we're going to walk down through all of these, and you can take notes if you so please. But it says this in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, beginning at verse number 1. It says, when the Sabbath was over... Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? Looking up, they noticed that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting at the right side. They were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he told them. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they put him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. They went out and ran from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. The overarching important thing that you need to learn from this section of the scriptures is that Jesus has risen. He is not there. Jesus has been resurrected from the tomb His female disciples go to the tomb to prepare his body for burial the same way we would send our loved ones to the mortician upon their death to be prepared for their burial. And they're going there early in the morning. They have pounds of spices and and oils and everything to perfume and to anoint his body for burial. I want you to notice something, loved ones, that these are the same ladies that have been with Jesus from the time of their salvation. These are the same ladies that we were introduced on last week when we were in chapter 15. These are some of Jesus' most faithful disciples. Even when all of the 11 disciples, the male disciples, left and ran, they turned tail and ran, we learned that they stayed with Jesus. And now these ladies on that first resurrection Sunday morning, they get up early in the morning to go tend to their Messiah, and they bring spices, and they prepare to anoint his body, prepare his body for final burial. God chose these ladies, some might argue, some of his most faithful disciples to be the first witness of his miraculous resurrection. Not even the grave could hold Jesus. This historical event serves as a powerful witness to his disciples. The angel invited the women to see where Jesus had been laid, yet all they found was his death shroud, the linens in which they had wrapped him in. They were folded up in the shape of his body on the bench where they placed his body. The angel commissioned the women to tell the disciples that Jesus had been resurrected back to life. Their God is not dead. He is alive. In fact, he had gone ahead of them to Galilee just as he promised that he would. 
they would see him yet again. It's important to remember that the 11 male disciples were distraught. We saw them, that they're all discombobulated, confused, they're grief-stricken, they're, they're all messed up on the inside. They don't know what to do with themselves. They had been with Jesus for three-plus years and spent time with him experiencing Jesus, watching the, the multiple uh, miracles that he did and his teaching and all of that. And now their Lord, now their rabbi, now their teacher is gone. Out of concern for them, Jesus used his faithful female disciples to witness his resurrection and bring the good news to them, to the 11. Isn't it weird that these are the men who have been charged to take the gospel to preach the gospel, to teach the gospel to other people, and now they need to be evangelized all over again? Isn't that weird? You guys, does that strike you guys as weird? Or at least a little bit intriguing? Maybe not weird is too hard of a word. In verses 9 through 20, we see that despite the ladies' fear, they deliver the angel's message that Jesus has risen, and they deliver it to the 11 disciples. And they respond in overwhelming joy, right? The disciples, they lose their mind. Jesus is alive. He's arisen. They respond because they are excited and they're joy-filled, right? Not exactly. They don't believe that Jesus has come back. Despite being told on multiple occasions by Jesus himself that he would be raised in three days, their grief and their shame-riddled hearts, it blocked them from receiving the good news. It's only after Jesus appears to them personally that the 11 disciples actually believe that Jesus has been resurrected from the grave. And we see that in Mark 16, 16. Isn't it interesting that he didn't scold them for rejecting him? Jesus, it says that Jesus rebuked them in verse 16. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't scold them for, for, for denying him, for rejecting him, but rather he corrects them, he rebukes them because of their unbelief in his resurrection. As if to say, all that you have done up to this point is forgiven, but this resurrection thing, you've got to believe in this. You've got to see me now. You've got to move forward in power and strength and confidence now. And it's on this very issue of unbelief that we want to look at. You see, the doctrine of the resurrection is challenging to grasp, let alone to actually believe. Unsurprisingly, not so unsurprisingly, many have tried to explain it using human logic and personal experiences to interpret what happened in the tomb with Jesus. Here's what we know. Man's theories are incapable of explaining what happened to Jesus. But despite that, there have been numerous attempts. Man's theories about what happened to Jesus in that tomb are incapable of explaining what happened to Jesus' body despite numerous attempts. And what I want to do is I want to share with you some of the most popular, some of the most well-known theories that have been put out there as an attempt to explain what happened to Jesus. And these um, explanations or pseudo-explanations, these are given to us by Bible teachers who have a very liberal theology and those who refuse to believe in Jesus. And you might be wondering, why is belief in the resurrection such a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because in order for you to believe in the resurrection, that means you have to give yourself over to, to Jesus' leadership. And if you are your own God, lowercase g, if you think you got it going on, if you think you're capable of, of guiding and directing yourself, you are never going to believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so if you believe that he's been resurrected, you have to believe that he's your Lord and Savior. And these people do not want to do that. And so they come up with all types of harebrained ideas about what happened to Jesus in that tomb as a way to, to explain away his resurrection. Number one, I, I brought these from Josh McDowell. Number one, here's the first one. The first one is the swoon theory. The swoon hypothesis. Some have argued that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, but merely he fainted. Um, this theory is called the swoon hypothesis. This view suggests that Christ fell unconscious from the shock and the pain and extreme blood loss, and, the, the, and he was mistakenly placed into, in the tomb. He was near flat line, but he wasn't completely flat line. He's placed in the tomb. Time goes by a few days, and miraculously, he heals up. We learned before that one of the reasons the Romans would scourge people or they would whip people was to bring them near to death so that when they were placed on the cross, they would die quickly. Jesus was placed in the tomb in that condition. He had just been taken down off the cross. And, and that tomb is dark and it's damp. I don't know if you know anything about the human biology, but when you have a wound, the doctors always say, keep it clean and dry. A tomb is not clean and dry. So how did Jesus miraculously heal himself? Not only that, Jesus would have to roll away the stone for himself and then sneak past the guards that had been placed at the entrance to his tomb. That's the swoon theory. That's one of the ways people have tried to say the resurrection isn't real. Number two is the hallucination theory. The hallucination theory. 
This theory claims that Christ's post-resurrection appearance were mere hallucinations, this diminishing them as illusions. I want you to consider something. The idea that hundreds of people experience the same hallucination simultaneously is improbable. I don't know about your past, but when my friends and I would do stuff to make us hallucinate, <laughs> we all had our own visions and thoughts and ideas flowing through our heads. Hallucinations are individual events. They're not shared group experiences. And so for more than 500 people to see the same thing and say the same thing about the thing that they saw being Jesus' resurrected body, it defies logic. Second, a very... Second, the very conditions of the resurrection appearances, they are the same no matter where they see Jesus. They all see Jesus, the risen Messiah, no matter where he represents himself to people. That's the hallucination theory. The next one is the imposter theory. This view suggests that post-resurrection appearances weren't Christ, but there was somebody impersonating him. They point to the instances where people didn't recognize him immediately but until he revealed himself to them or he told them who he was. They point to the fact that, that people sometimes had no clue who he was. This theory, it need, in, in order for it to believe, be believed, it has to consider several factors. Number one, the disciples spent day and night with Jesus for three years, for the most part. They knew how he smelled. They knew how he, his, they knew how he walked. They knew his mannerisms. They knew the tone of his voice. They knew how Jesus carried himself. How can someone sneak into that inner circle and then act as an imposter to convince people that he's really Jesus when he wasn't him? I don't know about you, but I've seen some really good Michael Jackson impersonators. <laughs> and can't none of them hold a candle to the real MJ. So how could people begin to think that there's this fake imposter that was raised up in Jesus' image or, or in, in, in his shape and be able to convince the disciples and all others that he's really not dead, but he's an imposter? Not, not, not a thing. Not a thing. Next is the spiritual resurrection theory. This is the argument that Jesus never raised bodily from the grave, but rather it was all spiritual. That Jesus was a, his, when people saw him, he was a ghost or an apparition. Jesus' body is still in the tomb, but his ghostly figure walked around, and he, he it hugged people and touched people and, and broke bread with people. I don't know that much about ghosts. I don't really believe in ghosts whatsoever, but I know one thing from the movies I've seen, that a ghost can't pick up a loaf of bread and break bread with you and eat. A ghost can't grab a, a, a bottle or, or, or a wine glass and drink with you. Jesus is reported to have what? Just sat down and ate with his disciples. And then you remember Thomas, right? Thomas got a chance to touch his wrist where his scars were at. You can't just touch air. You can't just touch a spirit. And so that's the spiritual resurrection theory. And then this is probably the most widely held or um, understood theory, the theft theory. This is the idea that Jesus' body was stolen from the tomb. And the reason why this one is more, most widely known is because in Matthew 28, 11 through 15, the soldiers guarding Jesus' tomb, they were bribed to say his disciples stole him during the night while he was sleeping. So the Sanhedrin wanted to bribe the, the, the centurion soldiers to lie about Jesus' body being stolen by the disciples to cover up the fact that Jesus had been resurrected from the grave. But this theory doesn't hold up. The linen wrappings that were raised, left around Jesus, wrapped around Jesus, they were left in the tomb. No one who's going to steal a dead, decomposing body is going to unwrap them from that covering and then take them with them to go put the body some other place. Not only that, but when the ladies are on the way to the tomb, what are they saying to themselves? Are they get ready to go spice Jesus' body? They said, hopefully we can find someone to roll the heavy stone door away. Jesus his body was not stolen from the grave. It was resurrected from the grave. And the person who rolled the stone away was God himself. The power that God has over all things rolled that stone away. These explanations for denying Jesus' bodily resurrection require more faith and mental gymnastics to believe than simply agreeing and saying, I believe that God raised Jesus from the grave. That he is risen. Risen indeed. The real issue isn't disbelief, but it's resistance to the life-changing implications of the truth. These people who have these theories, plus there's a lot more, they refuse to believe because they want to hold on to controlling their own lives. You know, 
It's not just about recognizing doctrinal errors. It's not just about calling out false theories about what happened to the resurrection that we need. We also need to be able to counter those lies with biblical truth. Much like skilled lawyers build compelling cases to win their arguments, so do we. And to build our case, we need evidence. And so we have lots of evidence. The New Testament provides compelling and abundant evidence that Jesus was raised back to life. Here's some compelling evidence for you that God is alive. Jesus is alive. Number one, Jesus said he he would be resurrected on the third day. We saw that several months ago in Mark 8, 31. Jesus said that he would be resurrected on the third day. This first piece of evidence is Jesus' own testimony about himself. He told his disciples about his impending betrayal, his death, and his resurrection as early as Mark 8, 31. Jesus explained that he would die and be raised back to life. Although his disciples did not fully grasp his words at the time, this does not diminish the fact that he forewarned them about his death and his resurrection. And so when these events occurred, they should have confirmed everything that Jesus had told them about himself. Unfortunately, we know that that the opposite was true for them. But the bottom line is still the bottom line. The bottom line is that Jesus had no doubt about what was going to happen after he died. And he is the first to say that he was and will be resurrected from the grave. And then we have the empty tomb that supports his resurrection. That's the second thing we have. The empty tomb itself supports the resurrection. And it's important to note, as you look at all the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all have an account of the tomb being empty. None of them say that there might possibly be or there was an image of Jesus there or likeness of Jesus. They all have them as, have it as empty. And then what about Jesus' multiple resurrection appearances? Jesus is seen by a multitude of people over a period of 40 days. First to Mary Magdalene, the one who had the, all those demons exercised from her that became one of Jesus' most devoted disciples. And then it's the other woman in Matthew 28, 9 through 10. And then Peter, the one who was the first one to betray Jesus, he actually becomes the first one to experience the resurrected Messiah. And then there are two other disciples on the road to Emmaus. You guys know that story. And then the disciples in the upper room, they experienced Jesus eating and breaking bread with them. Plus, we have 500 people at one time in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, who all attest to the fact that they saw Jesus' resurrected body. And then you have James, Jesus' younger brother. He sees Jesus. And I would add this, guys. Because he has been seen by a wide range of people in various places and different times, it adds credibility to his resurrection. Not only that, think about the disciples. The disciples, they do a complete 180, don't they? How were the disciples left when we found them in Mark 15? Were they upright, devout followers of Jesus Christ? No, they weren't. They were all messed up. They ran and they were fearful. They didn't know what to do. They're paralyzed emotionally. And they, 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 don't, they don't have a clue how to move forward without Jesus. And their shame had overtaken them. They were hiding in the upper room hoping that the Sanhedrin don't spot them out. And then later on, we learn about their bold witness. Later on, we learn how Peter preaches the the, the gospel in Jerusalem and thousands of people get saved. Later on, we learn how those men become the founders of that first church in Jerusalem. Later on, we learn that they are persecuted for their faith and they they will not renounce their faith in Jesus Christ no matter what. Some accounts say that Peter was so bold, so sure of his faith in Jesus Christ, in the end, when he's ordered to be crucified, he's crucified upside down because he says, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord and Savior. The disciples do a complete 180. And then what about Paul's transformation? Paul's transformation from the enemy of Jesus to his, one of his most devoted servants. Paul was determined to destroy the Christian faith. He even jailed and killed some Christians along the way. But when Jesus met him on that, that, on that lonely Damascus road, he opened his eyes to who he was, and Paul became a new man. Paul professed faith in Jesus Christ, and he became a dedicated follower of Jesus Christ. And he dedicated himself to making disciples and planting more churches. And Paul was one of the most prolific Bible preachers and also church planters. Of all the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, The experiences of the disciples and Paul, they resonate with us, with all of them. But I would say of all the evidence we have, the the transformation of the disciples and Paul, they speak most loudly to us. 
Because like them, we were fearful. Like them, we were like, we were, we were, we were against God. Like them, we were living in a way that was contrary to the Christian faith. Like them, we were on our way to a place we didn't want to go. I'll be the first one to tell him myself, I just live for Douglas. And I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. I don't care if I had to take advantage of you to get there. If I had to rob you, take advantage of you, I didn't care. I just wanted to make sure that I was pleased. And maybe some of you don't have a story that's as graphic as mine. Thank, but hopefully you don't. But nonetheless, we all have a before Jesus story. We all know who we used to be, how we used to think. And if your story isn't that dark, then glory be to God. He still died on the cross for your sins as well. But some of us took a little bit longer for that light to go off, for the Holy Spirit to say, hello, hello. And when that light went off, Jesus gave us eternal life by saving our souls. When that light bulb moment happened, when he exposed himself, when we saw him, he professed faith in him. He gave us a new heart that beats for him. Thus, believers in Jesus become living witnesses of the resurrection too, a transformation only that he could achieve for us. In other words, what I'm trying to say is this. The fact that you are living for Jesus Christ and no longer living for the world, living for Satan, is proof positive of the resurrection, that it, it has changed you. If it wasn't enough, then Jesus, like I started with, would still be in the grave, but Jesus has been raised and he's, it's changed you. The evidence for Christ's resurrection is compelling. We have more documents, more eyewitness accounts, and substantiating evidence than any other ancient historical event. It combines to build an overwhelming case for Jesus' physical resurrection from the grave. In legal terms, the evidence is rock solid beyond any reasonable doubt. Most, if not all of us, believe in Jesus. And most of us, if I were to ask you one-on-one -on -one, or maybe in a small group setting, if you believe that Jesus was resurrected from the grave, you would say, yeah, I believe that, Pastor. Sure, that's part of the gospel. I believe that. And if that's true of you, praise God. However, because this work was done on your behalf so long ago, it may not have the same sting, the same, the same zeal, the same impact on your life currently as it once did. If that's the case, then this final section is meant to help you because never should the, the work that Jesus Christ has done on our part, our behalf, become dull and passe, but rather it should remain fresh in our minds and our hearts. Jesus' resurrection is just as important today as it was 2,000 years ago. That's the last place we're going. Jesus' resurrection is just as important today as it was 2,000 years ago. And so I want to give you three um, three reasons why that's true. Number one, it's true because it proves that we've been saved from our sins. It proves that we have been saved from our sins. You have to pencil these in. I don't have the space for you guys. Um, fill in the blanks in your notes. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. Um, from Paul, we know that the wages of sin is, is spiritual death, <clears throat> complete and eternal separation from God. If Jesus is still dead, then there's no hope for us whatsoever. Paul makes this clear in 1 Corinthians 5. 15, 14, if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. If Jesus remained dead, we would have no hope of the resurrection or eternal life, and the gospel would be completely pointless. And then Paul further argues in verse 16 that faith in Jesus is worthless if he is still dead, leaving us stuck in our sins, destined to be eternally separated from God. But because Jesus rose from the dead, our faith is real, and he has fulfilled his promise. Therefore, we can be confident that because he lives, we will live on with him too. Death is merely the passageway. It's merely the doorway to eternal life with Jesus. Your faith is not pointless. You serve a risen Savior who conquered both sin and the grave. Amen? That's number one. Number two is this. Through the resurrection, Jesus, through the resurrection, God declares us justified. That's Romans 4.25. Through the resurrection, God declares us justified. In Romans 4.25, the Apostle Paul links the resurrection with our justification, changing our status from guilty sinners to righteous before the Lord. Paul states that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Jesus was crucified for our sins, but was res his resurrection, it confirms our justification. 
His resurrection shows that God approved of his work living sinlessly and dying for our sins. Again, if his work had been incomplete, then he would still be dead. I can't reiterate that enough times. And we would still be dead in our sins. But since he lives, we know that those in Christ are justified and our status has forever been changed from guilty to innocent. Next, last but not least, through the resurrection, and this is an amazing one, guys. Through the resurrection, God the Holy Spirit is gifted to us and takes up immediate residence inside of us. Through the resurrection, God the Holy Spirit is gifted to us and takes up immediate residence inside of us. Acts chapter 1, the resurrected Christ promises his disciples that he will send his helper to the Holy Spirit to help guide them and to, and to be there with them. And then in Acts 2 verse 4, the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside the disciples. In so doing, he empowered them and he, and to guide them and to provide them with comfort in times of extreme need. This matters to them, to us, because like the disciples, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.13. So upon profession of faith in Jesus Christ, you have received, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that word sealed is important in Ephesians 1.13 because it speaks of the fact that nothing else can get inside of us. There has been this ongoing debate over the past several years whether or not a Christian can be possessed with a demon. No. If you have been sealed with the blessed Holy Spirit, nothing else can get into you. Now, you can do some things against the Lord's will for you, but Satan no longer has control over you. You have been sealed with his Holy Spirit, and his Spirit takes up dwelling inside of us, and he leads us and guides us and protects us and empowers us to do things we wouldn't even imagine possible. Taken together, Jesus' resurrection <clears throat> matters to us today because we know for certain that we are saved. There's no need to wonder and doubt that Jesus do enough. Yes, he has. Like the saints who came before us, we stand justified before the Lord. Is God really okay with me? Absolutely he is because when he sees you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we have been gifted God's spirit. With the living God inside of us, we have been equipped and empowered to navigate this thing called life. Nothing we encounter, loved ones, will overtake us. Did you hear me? Nothing we encounter in this life has power to overtake us. If you are in Christ Jesus, you have God's spirit. Nothing in this life has the power to overtake you. And so Jesus' resurrection is just as important today as it was 2,000 years ago. And on the subject of the resurrection, here's the last thing I'll say. The resurrection is an undeniable reality with eternal significance. On that first Sunday, Jesus was raised from the grave. Although there have been many theories about what happened to his body, none of them are able to to fight against the fact that Jesus rose bodily from the grave. And never forget that Jesus' resurrection is just as important today as it was when it first happened. I pray that these truths plus others would permeate your heart causing you to have a deeper appreciation for Jesus and a renewed appreciation for what he alone has done. Loved ones, we have done a tremendous amount of work in the book of Mark, and you've heard a lot about the resurrection, a lot about chapter 16 of Mark. As Michael gets ready to lead us in worship again, how about we do this? Take a moment or so and contemplate something you heard, you experienced, or something you read for yourself, and then Michael is going to lead us back into a time of worship. I think the only thing that we should do upon hearing a sermon like this and thinking about the book of Mark as a whole is to fall on our knees and worship Jesus afresh. And so Michael is going to lead us in doing that. And however you feel led to worship the Lord, you just go ahead and let the Holy Spirit use you. And if you aren't excited about worshiping the Lord, then you probably need to do some confessing because your worship should should come from an outflow of what Jesus has done for you. If he's done much, which he has, then praise him much. If he's done little, which I doubt, then hold your praise. Therefore, I'm telling you, stand up and let's worship our God. God bless you guys.